Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Since other networks are determined to ignore it, we open tonight with more coverage of the horrific alleged rape in Rockville, Maryland. In just a minute, we'll show you the shocking emails, and they are shocking, that Montgomery County school officials have been sending to parents vowing to protect illegal aliens at all costs and threatening anyone who complains about that. But first tonight, police say they have ample evidence that the accused illegal immigrants Henry Sanchez Milan and Jose Montano are guilty. But San Sanchez now has a squad of lawyers saying that he is, in fact, innocent. Watch. Well, you know, it just seems that the physical evidence is not there. There's no scratches. There's no bruises. There's no uh, uh, injuries like that. There's physical evidence of both a, uh, a rape and sex assault, yes. She's absolutely adamant that she did not want this to happen whatsoever at all. Well, David Moise is an attorney, a partner at the firm representing Sanchez Milan, and he joins us to tonight. Mr. Moise, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank so, you, Tucker. There are reports that you all plan to argue at your firm that the rape was, in fact, consensual. Uh, two men, one of them a legal adult at 18, the other 17, and a 14-year-old girl in a high school bathroom. How could that in any sense be consensual? Well, Tucker, this is a, an ongoing case. This has just happened last Friday. And yes, the preliminary indications we have was this was a consensual encounter, not a rape in any sense. Between two guys, 17 and 18, and a 14-year-old girl in a high school bathroom, I mean, you'll pardon me if I seem astonished that you would be bold enough to assert something like that. That seems insane. It certainly seems horrible that that would occur in our schools, even consensual. It seems like something that we wouldn't want in our community. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it was forced or coerced or in any way illegal. But I mean, that's just that. But even saying that out loud, I mean, is a fact in effect an attack on this girl who told authorities that she was raped. So is your argument going to be that she invited sex with two men in a bathroom at her high school in the middle of the day and then lied that it was rape? Tucker, I think what you're going to find is as this case goes on, there is a lot more evidence that will come out. And all of us involved are ethically constrained from discussing details. But this case will go through the course, and the system will have evidence that comes out. It's Who's not paying? just what has been the initial sensational headline. So, so what's I mean, you're a partner in a real law firm. Um, you right. weren't assigned this case. You, you apparently took it voluntarily. Why did you do that? And who's paying for the defense of this guy you're representing? Well, I, I don't know that I'm going to get into details of who. His family retained us. His father is in this country and hired us to, to do this case. And this is what we do. We represent people who've been accused of crimes. It's what but our why, nation has done since but, its founding. But why wouldn't you, quote, get into details of who's paying you? Why not? I, I bound by many ethical considerations, such as what I've been told by my client, what I know about the case that cannot be made public. And so I've got larger responsibilities to my job and my license and my practice and my client, but I can't talk about everything. So this kid was facing deportation. Um, if he's found innocent, if you get him off on these charges, will you continue to take up his case to keep him in the United States? You know, I don't do immigration law. I, we have attorneys at our firm that do. My understanding is that this young man will face deportation, even if exonerated from what the accusations are. What do you think of that? I think that's a larger issue that I'm not hired or paid to talk about. But I can tell you that the focus right now as an attorney and as a human being is on making sure that our children are protected, making sure that the bottom line of this story is found out, the truth, one way or another. So be honest, would you be comfortable having your 14-year-old girl in class with this guy? I have two children. I live in Montgomery County. They're young children. They're not in school yet. But I want nothing but safety for my children, their friends, my family, and everyone in my community. Right. Well, okay, we all do, but that's not answering the question. This specific guy, your client, would you feel comfortable having a loved one go to school with him? I, I don't know him. I, I literally don't know him, and I, I can't begin to answer that question about a single specific individual. Certainly these allegations have caused everyone a lot of concern, and they should. This, this is absolutely a horrific allegation. But I mean, I, I think that's something you would think through since you're gonna be arguing in public on behalf of this guy, and so doesn't his character, his, his capacity or not to do something like this, does that enter into it? Do you think, you know, is this guy guilty or not? Is that a consideration for you? 
everything's a consideration. I'm sure there could be a number of questions asked about all three of the people involved in this. Five days into it, really? you can't what, what, answer what those questions. questions? What, what would the That's questions why trials raised, take several what, months. What, what would the questions be raised about the 14-year-old girl who says that she was raped in the high school bathroom and apparently whose screams were heard by her classmates? What questions would you raise about her? I don't know. I wonder what questions were raised about the accuser in the Duke lacrosse case or what this was raised the on the Rolling Stone this Virginia the, this case. This isn't the Duke lacrosse. I'm asking you a straightforward question. You're the one who brought it up. You said questions could be raised about her ominously, and I'm asking what questions? Well, you just talked about the character and the, the different aspects of Mr. Sanchez. I think everyone involved, the person accused and the person making accusation, puts their character into play. Man, you better be right about this, because if you're going to be impugning the character of a 14-year-old girl who says she was raped, other people say they heard her screams. I, I mean, to impugn her character, I mean, you really, before God, better be sure that you're on the right side of this. Does that occur to you? I think what occurs to me is that we have a system here, and when people are accused, we go through the system. But you don't Nobody. need to trash the accuser, Nobody. and you're already beginning it. You're, you're already suggesting I, that I there are questions that can be—you I mean, know exactly what you're doing. And you I'm speak not precisely in any your, way. Well, of course you are. Questions could be raised. That's exactly what you're saying about her credibility, about her character. You just said that. And my only point to you is, have you thought through the moral consequences? And I know you play a role, and I'm glad defense lawyers exist. But before you say something like that, do you think, man, I'm kind of putting my soul on the line here a little bit before doing something like that? Do, do you have those thoughts to yourself? I, I, I'm a human being, and I have all of those thoughts. I think as we learn more about this case and as you see more of the facts, everyone will be able to evaluate this case. Okay. It's, it's, it is okay. day five. Yep, that's true. And there's, there's a lot of things we don't know. But I mean, that's I think should be a consideration for you. Finally, can you, can you see why? And you, you have said, look, his immigration status is irrelevant. But can you see why people don't think it is irrelevant? Because he was in and out of U.S. custody a bunch of times, federal custody and then state custody in Maryland. And he was let go. And now he's accused of a violent rape against a child. So if he had been deported, as he should have been legally, you'll concede, we wouldn't be here today. So why is his immigration status irrelevant? It sounds like it's very relevant to me. His immigration status is irrelevant to whether or not he did it. And my job is to defend him and to try and get to the bottom of the facts of whether or not he did. So it isn't relevant to the issue of whether or not this occurred. And that is exactly my point in that answer. Well, I mean, we, but he, he wouldn't have been in the school. He wouldn't have been accused. He wouldn't have retained you. The girl wouldn't have questions raised about her character if he hadn't been here, right? Right. This also isn't the first sexual assault case where I've ever been hired for. And yeah. many of them are citizens, natural born citizens. Right. So it's not an issue of whether or not people committing these crimes are immigrants. It's whether or not these crimes are being committed. Well, people who already have broken a crime and shouldn't be here in the first place wouldn't have committed the crime if they weren't here. But maybe that's too obvious. Mr. Reese, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you, Carl. Tucker. A series of emails with you that were sent by the superintendent of Montgomery County, Maryland schools. A man who calls himself Dr. Jack R. Smith, he sent him to the parents who placed their kids under his care. The emails are fascinating. They're a true showcase of his values. To Dr. Jack R. Smith, the worst crime imaginable is not sexual violence against a child, but naughty language he considers intolerant. In an email sent just today, for example, he seems more upset by the aftermath of the alleged crime than by the rape itself. He lectures parents who have voiced their horror about the attack, warning them that, quote, Far too many have crossed the line with racist, xenophobic calls and emails. Not only are those calls offensive, he says, but they're also somehow illegal. As he puts it, they will not be tolerated, and they'll be reported to the police of Montgomery County, who presumably have never heard of the First Amendment. He speaks much more harshly about xenophobia than he does about sexual assault of a child. And it's not the only email he sent like this. His colleagues in the Montgomery County school system have sent a ton of them. One week after the November election, his district had every principal sent an email that warned hate speech, something they never bothered to define, would be punished severely. They urged kids to report cases of offensive messages to the proper authorities. Last Friday night, the very day after the alleged rape in Rockville, Smith sent a school-wide email lamenting, on the basis of no actual evidence, that, quote, hate-based incidents are on the rise across this country, something a lot of people say, but no one actually proves. And he urges students to participate in a contest denouncing hate a term that apparently encompasses any political expression that school administrators disagree with. Well, none of this has anything to do with education, of course. It's a political indoctrination, and it's done by force. They're not even trying to hide it. In January, this district took a stand for illegal immigration. They sent an email letting parents know that Montgomery County, quote, remains a welcoming learning environment for all students, regardless of immigration status. T 
teachers, the email continued, will do nothing to report illegal immigrants. Now, you'd think that somewhere, someone in the sprawling and highly paid Montgomery County education complex would pause and regret sending an email like that, given that an illegal alien now stands accused of raping a child in one of their school bathrooms. But apparently there are no second thoughts in Rockville. It's full steam ahead with the same old diversity agenda at all costs. And by the way, if you don't like it, shut up or we'll call the cops. Well, the powers that be in Montgomery County certainly don't want you thinking critically about the country's immigration laws. Fortunately, we're not going to listen to them tonight. Does the Rockville case expose the critical flaws of this country's immigration laws? We're joined now by Dan Stein, who's president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. We're also joined by Alex Little, a criminal defense attorney and former assistant U.S. attorney. It's great to see you both. Good evening. So, Alex, the obvious question, which I just posed to the defense lawyer, is that this crime could have been prevented. Nobody really doubts that. If one of the men, and probably both, but one for sure at the center of this, had been deported as he was supposed to be, but the government didn't deport him, and now here we stand with a child claiming she was raped. This is inherently about immigration, and it's an enforcement in a law for, politi for political reasons. No, Tucker, I fundamentally disagree. I mean, the chain of causation that you're laying out is so far attenuated. I mean, I had cases as a prosecutor where a defendant would say, I did this because I needed to pay for my mother's cancer treatment, and he committed a burglary, an armed robbery. Is that case about health care reform, about whether we're going to reform Obamacare? No. The individual committed a violent crime. And here, but, but, the causation is what happened in that bathroom. But he wouldn't have been. He wasn't supposed to be here. Authorities fell down on the job. They didn't do what they were sworn to do, what they had sworn to do, because of sure. political pressure. He wouldn't have been, I mean, we wouldn't be here at all. This is not attenuated. This is direct. You know, you know I think if, if that's what uh, this case is about, then I think we're, we're focusing on the right, wrong thing. We have an individual who's a potential rape victim. She's not the only rape victim in this country. And I think it's important that we focus on all of them. I represent rape victims. I don't want to tell rape victims that one rape is more important or less important or part of a broader narrative because the race or national origin immigration status oh, stop. Stop. of the rapist. Stop. You know what? I'm not going to sit here for that. No one's attacking his race. That's ridiculous. Well, no, but it's, That's it's a the immigration herring. status. I'm certainly not. I'm just, I'm just saying, look, Dan, here's what separates this rape from a lot of rapes. And immigrants are not the only people who commit rape. I'm not suggesting that because it's not true. I'm really saying this is one that could have been prevented. That's all I'm saying. Look, what's happening in Montgomery County is happening across the country, which is that parents, concerned citizens, are asking why. I mean, what has happened to the American mind? that we've seen a decline in the intellect, that we can't put together the pieces of a puzzle to figure out what are these guys doing here? Why are they in the same classroom or the same school with 14-year-old girl when these guys are 17, 18? Why are they in the ninth grade? How did they get in through the border? Who actually created the environment that let this all happen? And of course, there's a chain of causation. 1982, Supreme Court, biggest federal mandate in history, Plyler right. versus Doe, everybody here illegally has to go to public school. Then Senator Feinstein, Joe Biden when he was in the Senate, so-called Wilberforce language that says a law designed to protect child tra tra traffickers from children, children from traffickers, is now being used by smugglers. And lo and behold, what we're now facing is a big battle between Donald Trump who's trying to crack down, and many Republicans, and the Democratic Party and Democrat-controlled states and counties setting themselves at defiance to the Trump administration to say, not only are we going to promote the concept of illegal immigration, we're going to do what we can to obstruct justice. There's no reason that these two guys should have been in the country. They came in here illegally. Well, right. They well, were released. They never really had a hearing date for deportation because basically the Democrat Party position on this now is unless you commit a dangerous felony, you shouldn't be deported. Well, you know what that means? You're going to have people here illegally who are committing felonies who have no criminal record. Like but I, I would correct you there, though, and, and pose this question to Alex. I think that pro-immigration advocates would have more authority if they agreed with the president that if you commit a felony that you can be deported and yet they argue against that they're against the deportation of no, criminal that's aliens. the law Why Tucker. Is that's that? absolutely that's absolutely the law i mean if you commit a felony even if you're a green card holder oh, I'm, you can oh, be I'm deported aware. what's the law you're not supposed and, to be illegally anyway but when trump says we're going to deport them all of a sudden sure. you know it's crystal knocked like what is that why why wouldn't they say yeah we don't want criminal aliens here no but they don't I, say that I, I, I don't think people disagree about that. I think the question is where do you place the yeah, enforcement do. and where do you where do you focus your priorities? And I think here we've seen some troubling signs that the ICE is not focusing their priorities on dangerous cr dangerous criminals when they're setting up outside churches or outside hospitals or homeless shelters. The very disturbing case of a domestic violence victim who was taken into custody after reporting her abusive husband. 
And so when you have immigration authorities doing that, I think there's a real debate about whether that's the right approach or whether you do take folks who are violent felons, right. take so, them off the street and deport them. Which, which basically, though, what people are saying is just don't enforce the law. So like, why not just change the law in but Congress? That's kind of my question. Because it's, it's a bankrupt idea that you shouldn't be deported unless you commit an independent felony. Right. Because in the end, you're creating a swamp of illegal activity. And you don't really know the identity of somebody if they're here illegally. And all the Supreme Court said in 1982 was, if a child is here illegally, they ought to be enrolled in public school until they're deported. But that doesn't mean the school doesn't have a responsibility to verify residency or status. I know all about the Montgomery County school system, Tucker. They do not verify of real no, identity. They don't care about the actual age of these guys. That's why they were in the school. And, I mean, basically, Montgomery County is running a segregated school system. You look at performance, and you can see how people self-segregate right. within the school system. Of course. And Rockville used to be a great school, but now it's kind of declining because the Montgomery County politics are creating this. Anyway, I, I, I know. We're out, line, unfortunately, we're out we of time. What we have to do is make sure we sustain Larry Hogan's veto, Governor Hogan's veto right. of the Trust Act. That's everything what we're going to try to do at FAIR now is to stop that bill in the, in the, in the state assembly. Dan, thank you. Alex, thank you. Recently, we decided to take a more detailed look at the link between immigrants and crime in this country. It was really interesting. Here's part of what we found. When Donald Trump announced his candidacy for president of the United States, he triggered untold numbers of journalists and pundits by expressing his thoughts on Mexican immigrants. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. An exclusive analysis of data collected by the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency largely vindicates the president's claim that U.S. immigration policies are contributing to crime in the country. Data from each of the DEA's 20 domestic divisions shows that of the 767 fugitives with known birthplaces, 83% of them were born outside of this country. In effect, the U.S. has imported a foreign criminal class that operates a multi-billion dollar drug trade within our borders. Perhaps more surprising is what's happening within America's most violent cities, where foreign fugitives dominate the most wanted lists. In violence plagued Detroit, for example, just 7% of the DEA's fugitives are listed as born in the United States. DEA divisions in New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Seattle, and Dallas don't list a single American-born fugitive on their most wanted lists. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people, but I speak to border guards and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. One counterpoint to these statistics is that drug traffickers are more likely to be from outside the country given the nature of the business. There's also the fact that foreign criminals might be more difficult to track down and therefore more likely to remain on most wanted lists. But that does not change the fact that there is a strong link between lax border enforcement and the black market for drugs. But beyond the drug trade, federal fugitives remain disproportionately foreign-born. Federal crime statistics, for example, show that even though just 13% of America's population is foreign-born, Mexican citizens alone make up more than 14% of the entire federal prison population. One of the most disturbing statistics uncovered was that 36% of fugitives on the FBI's Crimes Against Children Most Wanted list were born outside of this country. Those fugitives include Mexican-born Hugo Sanchez, an alleged serial rapist who preys upon young children, Luis Tejada of El Salvador, wanted for distributing child pornography, and Mexican-born Jose Antonio Barroso, who allegedly raped a five-year-old. Well, none of this is news to Ann Coulter, who spent years warning about the immigrant crime connection and been reviled for it. She's been a fan of President Trump, but she did go after him on Twitter two days ago, saying this about his falling approval rating. Quote, Trump got elected for the wall, deportations and trade. Instead, he's doing tax cuts in Obamacare light. No surprise. Ann Coulter joins us now. Ann, thanks a lot for coming on. So that, that Thanks tweet, for having me. That tweet got a lot of attention. You, you've written a book in support of Donald Trump. I think it's fair to say you're supportive of his program, but I think what you were saying was he's not putting the priorities of his campaign at the top of his priorities as president list, and that's a problem. Yeah, no, they seem to be Paul Ryan's priorities and also just the standard GOP corporatist stuff. Um, what what um, made Donald Trump stand apart from the crowd and apart from the crowd from, from every presidential candidate for the last 20 years was immigration, trade, infrastructure, um, building a wall. 
Uh, obviously, that was very, very popular. A lot of people haven't been listened to all this time. And uh, look, I like tax cuts. I'd love to have my taxes cut. But 50 percent of the people don't even pay taxes. Um, right. I think the bigger problem now is jobs. And I, I will not hold the emperor god Trump responsible for this Obamacare light bill. But Oh, for Pete's sake, what, do, am I the last person in America who understands the free market? Actually, Son, Sean Spicer was very good today explaining to idiot reporters that, <laughs> that getting rid of mandated coverage doesn't mean insurance companies won't cover it. It means, you know, Anne won't be required to pay for 15 services, actually probably more like 50 services that I have no interest in. Um, but to listen to them all talking about, about how... I don't know, Congress is going to give us these things. No, Congress can give us nothing. The free market can give us things. And, and they're coming up with the premiums? No, I think, who would be better to come up with a premium? Someone whose business it is and needs to come up with a good premium to, to compete, <laughs> to get my business. No, good question. And who has disease specialists and actuarial specialists or politicians in Washington. So you're, you're hearing, speaking of politicians in Washington, you're hearing some of them and an awful lot of school district officials here in Montgomery County say there's no connection at all between our immigration policy and this crime that apparently happened last Friday in Rockville. You're laughing. I, I, I am. It is just stunning, this, this argument that, oh, well, you know, a lot of things. Criminals tell me I had to rape that girl because my mother wouldn't give me a dollar. Well, okay, but... We can't control whether his mother gave him a dollar. Immigration policy is the definition of something we can control. Who comes into the country? No, there are all these Americans who wouldn't have dead children, who wouldn't be raped, who wouldn't be dead themselves or undergoing facial reconstruction surgery or be addicted to heroin, but for our immigration policy. That's something we can change. Let's change it. <laughs> well, what's interesting, though, is that the, there seems to be a profound, and we could do an hour on this, but quickly, a misalignment between what the president ran on and what the Republican leadership stands for. So on Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House website, it's a single him out. But on his website right now, he says we need to encourage legal immigration. Now, that's a real position, but it's not really <laughs> consistent with what the president ran on, from what I can tell. No, and uh, Paul Ryan was the vice presidential candidate of a losing uh, presidential ticket. So I think Republicans ought to be moving to Trump's position rather than Trump moving to their position. I mean, I think what Congress ought to be doing now, I, I, I would like them to pass a, an Obamacare repeal that says there shall be a free market in health insurance so right. that those of us who are healthy and able to pay can buy a plan any normal human would want. <laughs> Start with that, you know, 80 percent of the country, and then you can do the welfare cases. But if they're not going to do that, how about they love comprehensive immigration bills. How about a comprehensive bill simply with the, most of what Trump wants to do on immigration, he can do because he's president of the United States. But look at how the courts have reacted. Just let yeah. Congress go through and endorse everything Trump wants to do. Well, that's right. Wall. I mean, and by the way, our uh, laws are supposed to come from Congress. Keep in mind, as you know. Ann Coulter, thanks for joining us. Turned if I was the president, uh, and that's why I wanted him to know, and I felt like I had a duty and obligation to tell him because, uh, as you know, he's been taking a lot of heat in the news media, uh, and I think to some degree uh, there are some things that he should look at to see whether, in fact, uh, he thinks the collection was proper or not. That was House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunez talking to Sean Hannity. You'll hear more from him tonight at 10 o'clock. Also, Fox's James Rosen is reporting tonight that there could be a smoking gun, proof that the president was surveilled by the Obama administration during the transition and maybe before. We're joined now by Lanny Davis. He's been in Washington a long time. He was special counsel uh, to the president in the White House under Bill Clinton. Uh, Lanny, great to see you. Great to see you. So this is a fast-moving story. There's a lot we don't know. I think we've got to concede that. But there are some things we do know, and there are two tracks. One is the debate over whether the president should have sent that tweet in the first place. Okay. But there's a deeper question, I think, about is our government spying for political purposes? So we know a couple of things, but here's one that I think we can, we can say for certain we know. The FBI has not responded, apparently, to the House Intelligence Committee's request for documents as they're trying to figure out what exactly happened. Now, the FBI won't respond to the House Intel Committee, which provides oversight. Things are out of control, aren't they? Well, first of all, I disagree with uh, Director Comey's decision to go public to confirm what the FBI is investigating. I agree. It's completely improper. He did it when he disclosed his investigation of Hillary Clinton I agree with emails. you there, too. 
and he was wrong to confirm an investigation of the uh, contacts with the uh, Trump campaign. So to be consistent, I think Comey is acting improperly. But secondly, we all ought to be careful about jumping to conclusions. I certainly uh, don't think that Mr. Trump meant that literally Barack Obama himself was wiretapping Trump Tower. Right. But he should stay off Twitter and be president. Well, I, I, of course I agree with that and, and said that to him directly. But I think there's a much more important debate that we need to have about to what extent can the U.S. government spy on its own citizens and should they ever be authorizing spying of political opponents? Even if it's warranted, it's really a dangerous place to go. Liberals used to jump up and down about this, but no more. I completely agree, but the only evidence, I completely agree, I'm a civil libertarian and be inconsistent if I said it's okay now, but it wouldn't be okay if it was Democrats. But there's still uh, only evidence that people were incidentally overheard when a target with a FISA warrant who is an intelligence target such as a Russian spy I'm not sure might that, be that talking that's, that to that's an American. True. So here's what James Rosen is reporting and it's consistent with what we already know. We know that the names in the reports were unmasked, which is to say they were not redacted before being sent around to what is in fact a massive intel community, certain to leak. That's against protocol. And we know that this apparently, this investigation did not pertain to the Russians. It was something else, and it was authorized by the Obama administration. So just knowing those facts, I'm thinking they've crossed the line. You can't do that to a political opponent. That's crazy time. Well, you don't know facts yet, uh, Tucker. You well, we do know because we know the chairman said the names were not redacted. They were unmasked in the terms that they uh, used. Well, the, the chairman shouldn't be speaking at all. That may be true, but and, now that uh, we know that, that we, we, it's we, not we, a small thing. We, we only know that he said it. We haven't seen it, and I would like to suggest that the chairman, whether Democratic or Republican of an intelligence committee, has to be bipartisan or nonpartisan. But let's assume that it's true, then that's wrong. But we also have to assume that the FISA warrant process, which involves Russian agents or intelligence who are talking to any Americans and are picked up incidentally, that's completely legal. But we don't know that just either. Because, uh, just two things really quickly. We don't actually know that any of this took place under FISA, actually. We don't know that. No. There are other ways that they could have done Although this. Although Mr. Comey uh, should not have said this, but he said that as far as he was concerned, okay, the tweet was uh, not But uh, something correct. can be legal, as you found out working for the Clinton administration, and still be wrong, unseemly, unethical. This is a, this is a law. I mean, here's the last point I'm going to make. Shouldn't liberals defend the principle that the U.S. government yes. should not be spying on its own citizens without really good reason, and you should never do it to your political opponents if you have any choice at all. Absolutely. We have to be consistent, but yeah. you're using the expression we have uh, evidence that there's been spying on citizens when the only spying that we know about is incidentally picking up an American talking Still to a spying. Russian agent. <laughs> Still spying. No, no, it, no yeah. it's, it's absolutely appropriate if you're uh, looking at a Russian agent talking yeah. to an American, it gets picked up, and then there should definitely Maybe. be a redaction. Pick up everything, as you know. Lainey, thanks for it's joining us. Great to be back uh, great to see with you. you. Thank Doug. you. Are not afraid, and our resolve will never waver in the face of terrorism. What I can confirm is that the man was British born and that some years ago he was once investigated by MI5 in relation to concerns about violent extremism. That was British Prime Minister Theresa May speaking in Parliament just a few hundred feet from where terrorist Khalid Massoud murdered a police officer and several bystanders in a violent rampage yesterday. The Trump administration has already sent its condolences to Great Britain, but does the administration see any policy implications from that attack? Katie McFarlane is the Deputy National Security Advisor to the President. She joins us from the White House. Thanks a lot for coming on tonight. Um, what are the specific policy implications for the United States of this attack, do you think? Well, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that the attacks are growing, that the, the threat is not gone, that you can't look away from what's happening. In fact, yesterday, while I was conducting and uh, ministerial, there were 68 nations of the anti-ISIS coalition. We were at the State Department, 
and I was moderating the discussion of the 68 foreign ministers and going around the room asking, you know, what are you seeing in North Africa? How has the threat evolved in Asia? What are the efforts we're making to shut down terrorist finance? What do you see happening with foreign fighters returning from the battlefield in Iraq and Syria to the homelands? And as we were going around the room talking about it, we got word that there were att the attack in London. And so the foreign secretary of Great Britain, Boris Johnson, who was sitting right next to me, I turned to him and said, very much clear of what's happened in the world today is this is getting worse. It's not getting any better. And he said, well, we, the British people, you know, we have had attacks like this before. We may have them again, but we are resolved. And the same um, sentiments that the prime minister may said today, which is that they are not going to be cowed by this. And we, the Western world, see this as an affront and attack against all civilization. And we stand united. And that's, you know, the good thing about it, not that there's much to say that's good, but that there was a 68 member coalition, 68 nations, which are standing up and saying we are going to work together in every way we can to defeat this and to destroy radical Islam right. and to destroy ISIS and everything that follows. So to the extent you can uh, reveal it in public, mm -hmm. what are the specific steps do you think that we ought to be taking uh, that we haven't taken before, perhaps, to address this? Well, well, the Trump administration is looking at this as a whole of government. And right. yesterday at this ministerial, the, to, to make that case and the, and the demonstration of the symbolism of it was the Secretary of State hosted it. I'm from the National Security Council. I ran the ministerial. The Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis, was there and spoke as well. And we had all the senior cabinet members there, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Homeland Security. So I think the policy implications are that it's an immediate threat. It's something that the president is considering. We have uh, Secretary Mattis has just given to the president a comprehensive plan to deal with radical Islam, but also with ISIS in the region of Iraq and Syria. And it's something that the president Trump understands. It's not just going to be some sanctions. It's not just going to be a little effort in one part of the world, but it's going to be a broad and comprehensive effort, not just with the United States, but with our allies. Right. And radical Islam threatens us not only in the U.S. homeland, but throughout the world. So I have to ask you about Susan Rice, who mm -hmm. occupied a job not so different from yours, and she wrote a piece recently in the Washington Post scolding the Trump administration for its mm -hmm. misuse of language for, in effect, its lying to the public. What was your response to that? Well, in effect, you mean lying to the American public about the threat of radical Islam? Right. I mean, for using language that was uh, untrue, making claims that can't be supported. She basically scolded the Trump administration. Um, well, you know, I'm not sure that scolding anybody makes a whole lot of sense when you have a threat like this that just happened in right. London. Um, it's the times for scolding and identifying problems and wringing our hands, it's over, whether it's in dealing with North Korea or whether it's dealing with the radical Islamist threat. The Trump administration and President Trump himself has made it very clear that we're not just going to talk about stuff and identify problems, but we're actually going to have some solutions. KT McFarland, thanks a lot for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Tucker. Very close vote. After we repeal and replace Obamacare, and by the way, it's close not because Obamacare is good, it's close for poli politics. They know it's no good. Everybody knows it's no good. It's only politics because we have a great bill and I think we have a very good chance. President Trump and House Speaker Paul Ryan have been pushing hard to get the Republican Party behind their proposed Obamacare replacement. They might not manage it. A vote was canceled today at the last minute. Congressman Trent Franks of Arizona has faced heavy pressure to support the bill, and he joins us tonight. Congressman, thanks for coming on. Are thanks, you going to support this bill? Tucker, it looks like it's going in a, in a better direction. The Freedom Caucus has prevailed in getting a very critical amendment that will be going on tonight or early in the morning. And uh, only time will tell. I've remained undeclared so that we maximize our capability to influence the bill in the right direction up to the very end. And uh, uh, so I have to leave it there. But I will tell you that I'm proud. Of, uh, I should say I'm just I'm just uh, grateful for the the Freedom Caucus and their willingness to to go at it as long as they have. Some people call that acrimony, but really it's just creative tension, and it makes things happen sometimes. Right. You wish it would be easier, but it isn't. But, so one of the knocks against Obamacare, and I, I certainly thought it was legitimate, was the idea that there was no real public debate about what was in it. Famously, you had to vote for it before you found out what was in it. Right. And that's not a good way to make law that no. applies to the entire country, but that's how law is being made here. Do you see the irony in that? 
Well, yeah, the, the truth is, this has been far more, I was there when Obamacare was passed uh, seven years ago. I lost my voice trying to fight Obamacare. And there was no openness, there was no amendments allowed, nothing. The leadership here has allowed uh, open discussion and the president has been more involved and more hands-on than any president I've ever seen in history, my 15 years in the Congress. And uh, so I'm pretty impressed with, uh, with some of the things that have happened. I wish the bill could be better, but here's the real untold story. And, and it's hard to articulate, but it is so true and I challenge the media to understand this better. We're having to put this through the bird rule in the Senate for one reason, and that is that the Senate rules won't allow us to bring it to the floor, even bring it to right. the floor in the Senate under regular order. So therefore, we can't get the people involved in the debate, and we have no real leverage against Democrats that would, I, would keep I know, it. But, but, and I understand that, and you're being blocked at every turn, but it does remind me of one of those dreams you have where you show up at school the day of the exam and you kind of forgot to study. I mean, seven years to think through what should replace Obamacare, and literally the details are not settled now, and the vote well, supposedly is tomorrow. That's not which quite true. Like, that's not oh. quite true, Tucker. We, we had a motion to, to commit, to recommit the bill that very day that it passed. We had an right. alternative, a Republican alternative, and we've had several bills in the, in the past several years that I've signed on to, Dr. Price's bill. We've right. had alternatives, but none of them will fit through the Byrd rule. And okay. people don't understand that. The bird rule just makes it, it's kind of like trying to shove a camel through a keyhole. He's a little worse for the wear on the other side. And, uh, and the, the, the truth is we only have four ways to pass a bill now of consequence in the Senate. We either have to repeal the laws of mathematics, or we have mm -hmm. to get eight Democrat senators to vote with us, which is harder than repealing the laws of mathematics, or we have to change the Senate rules, which at least we should change the first filibuster, uh, or we have to run it through reconciliation and this bird rule. And right. it makes it so and impossible, and there's doing. no accountability, there's total chaos, and that's what we're having to do, and it puts Paul Ryan in the impossible position of trying to uh, struggle and do what his base wants him to do, but what the rules will not allow him to do. He is in a tough, I, I, I agree with you there. I wouldn't want that job. Congressman Franks, good luck.